Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Find Your Edge. My name is Jordan Agoli, and thank you so much for listening and joining us today. Wherever you are in the world, whether you're listening or watching, I sincerely appreciate you being here. Guys, the show is finally live. We have three episodes out right now, and it's been shocking and overwhelming the positive feedback that we have received from everybody. They've really connected with the vulnerability, the honesty, the transparency, and just thank you to everyone that has liked, commented, shared, responded, given feedback. It means the world to me and to the team helping produce this show. We've put a lot of hard work, time, and energy into doing this, and it motivates us to just keep going and keep pushing forward. At this moment right now, let me double check the stats exactly. We have 47 Instagram followers, 68 Facebook likes, and 24 YouTube subscribers, and uh, I've never been more proud to have numbers, even though they're small right now. Just the fact that people are taking their time out of their day to listen and watch and participate in this show means the world to me. So we're, we're at the small numbers right now, but we are going to get to the thousands and then 10,000 and then 100,000 and a million uh, followers as time goes on. So thank you guys for being here and joining us right now. On this episode, we are joined by a truly special guest near and dear to my heart. His name is Edward Wilkins aka also known as Papa. He is my grandfather-in-law. He is my wife's grandfather. He just recently moved here from Los Angeles. He moved here to Atlanta, Georgia. And I wanted to have him on today because I think he is wise. I think he is hilarious. And he has got so many stories to share that I cannot wait to dive into. So Papa, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. Thank you, Jordan. Please, pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So Let's just start with with something simple. How do you like Atlanta so far? How has the move been? It's it's different. Yeah. It's, most of all, the weather. The weather and the traffic, that's entirely different. I had to learn the city, and that's going to be a challenge because from Los, in Los Angeles, I know everywhere. I know how to get from place to place, uh, point A to point B. And uh, here, I got to put on MapQuest, but uh, I'll learn. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> If it makes you feel better, I still have to put on MapQuest and I've lived here for 20 years. It's <laughs> okay. it's no joke. Even just driving here, we're talking about the traffic. Right. Uh, you also came here at an interesting time with pollen season. Oh, God. Talk to me about pollen, a.k.a. snow on the ground. Uh, it's funny because uh, my grandson, uh, Ed III, yeah. we're here. You have a red Cadillac. So I got came up, woke up and all this yellow stuff all over my car. What is this? And you know, my car get d dusty. I wipe it off. I got this mop in the back of my car. I just wipe it off. Well, I was wiping it off, and they just kept saying, don't do that. It's just going to be right back on there. I said, I need a car wash because we drove the car across country. And the bugs and stuff, Just to, I wanted to wash it. And yeah. I washed it. Then I said, okay, it looks fine. Well, the next morning, it was like it never happened. And the allergies, it's not, so, not as bad as I thought it would be, but even though it is all in my nose and my sinuses and stuff. I never, I never, uh, you know, lived in uh, Los Angeles. You don't have probably got small, you know. Mm. So, and uh, I'm, I'm adjusting. It's not, not too bad. It hasn't affected me too bad. That's good because it affects a lot of us. I've, yeah. I've been struggling. Okay. I'll pro I may sneeze a bit during this interview. I keep eye drops on me. My <laughs> eyes get red. Uh, I sneeze a lot. I take Claritin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the allergies. It's gotten bad the last few years. Uh, totally random. I didn't even mean to bring this up. Did you know that there's male and female trees? Did you no. know that? that? Okay, so apparently, and I, this could be wrong, but apparently there's male and female trees, mm. and that over the past few decades there's only been male trees planted, which is why there's so much allergic pollen reaction right now. I never knew that. Did they know they were planting male trees? I think they. They did. Uh, before I brought this up, I probably should have done some more research about <laughs> the reason behind it. <laughs> so don't quote me on this if, if I was wrong. Uh, but yeah, I mean, because the allergies are just terrible. I mean, yeah. there are days I'll wake up, my eyes will be puffy, dark underneath the um, bags under my eyes. I'll have I'll red eyes all day. Mm -hmm. So, And I'm not the only one. People that's, get well, that, that, that's what I have. That's the, the majority of it. But uh, not too much sneezing or anything. I just, I can feel it in my sinuses. And uh, but like I said, they got me with the clarity and I got some spray to go up your nose. And I never could stand anything go up my nose, but yeah. I've had to use it a couple of times since I've been here. But that's the most. Yeah. Well, I can imagine seeing pollen for the first time was yeah. a shocker. Yeah. <laughs> not not yeah. knowing what's there. Yeah. It's not been too bad this year. It's okay. not been too bad. So last year was pretty rough. Mm -hmm. It was pretty rough. But um, well, welcome to Atlanta. 
and it's it's great to have you here. What else we got going on? Uh, today is the first day of the NBA playoffs. Okay. That's starting. Talk to me about your predictions. Who do you think is going to make it all the way? I have no idea because I've only watched the Lakers, okay? I'm a Laker fan, die hard, uh, and uh, I watch the other teams when they play, but I've watched more basketball and football, more sports since October than I've ever watched, you know, continuously. Yeah. Because the family and the folks here in, in Georgia, it's sports is real big, you know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, football, baseball, all of it. But I'm, I'm a fan of all of it, but... My main teams are LA teams, you know, Rams, Lakers, Dodgers, and that's it. You know? Yeah. Do you have a sport that of all three you think is your most favorite or it's pretty equal? Pretty equal. I guess I grew up more around baseball because I remember when the Dodgers came to Los Angeles in fifty nine and um we didn't have a baseball we didn't have a baseball team. We had the the Angels, which was um a minor league team and they would uh they called the uh Hollywood Stars, and I remember going to, we had a park called Wrigley Field where minor league, minor leaguers play. Didn't have Dodger Stadium at the time. Back when the Dodgers came to Los Angeles, they played in the Coliseum for mm. two years. And that was a weird thing. Just, they set baseball up into a football stadium. So but so baseball, we grew up with playing baseball. Not much of basketball, but, but baseball and football because we had the Dodgers, we had the Rams. So Yeah. Yeah, so you've seen a lot of teams oh, yeah. throughout the years, there, yeah. a lot of changes. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to to have you on today because, number one, I wanted to just get to know you better and learn about your life story. Uh, you've been in L.A. You were born in 1946? Yes, August correct? 12th, 1946. August yes. 12th, 1946. So, I mean, you've seen the world change yes. rapidly yes. over the last 76 years. So let's just let's just start with that. You were born August 12th, 1946. Uh, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell me about your parents? Well, my parents were from uh, Dallas, Texas, the Dallas area. And um, my father was a, a blues singer. And my mother was a, she was a housewife. I, I'm the fifth of 14. I'm wow. the fifth child of 14. I had seven brothers and six sisters. And um, I just remember growing up, I could, far as back as I can remember, it was right after nursery school because I can, remember, I can remember going to kindergarten. And I remember before kindergarten was a nursery school. And they wouldn't let you in there unless you were potty trained or 18 months or older. And evidently I was potty trained early because I had two older brothers and I followed with them. So it was easy for me to get into the nursery school. In fact, they sent me home from my understanding because one of the smart teachers looked inside my mouth and realized I didn't have enough teeth <laughs> to be as old as they said I was. So, and that's uh, the farthest memory I can have I have of uh, my mother telling me that story. But I do wow. remember going to uh, kindergarten. Wow. What do you what do you remember most about your parents? Well, I never really lived with my father. By the time um I was old enough to know anything, I had a stepfather. Mm. So um I I don't we, we would go stay with my father over the weekend sometime and during the, a couple of weeks during the summer. But I was raised with my, my mother and my stepfather. You know, my mother was, uh, she only had one brother, mm-hmm. so I only had one uncle at the time. And um, But he had about four kids. And at that time, we were up to about six. And uh, so that's why I remember most of all, the, my, the extent of my relatives, except that more started coming. I met more cousins mm-hmm. and more more cousins, more and more. But uh, basically, our family that was our, our family unit was that's who we dealt with, you know. Now you said you you didn't really live with your father. Were your parents married and they had separated? Yes. Or the, okay. Yes, I mean, they're married and divorced. And um, like I said, I don't I don't even remember staying with my, fa- my mother and father staying together. So evidently, it happened when I was you know very young. Got it. And then remind me, you think you just said it, where did you fall in line of the four teams? You said you were the fifth born? I'm the fifth, yes. Fifth, okay. had two older sisters and two older brothers. And then what is the breakdown? I remember when we talked earlier, your oldest sister, your oldest sibling was born in 1936. Yes, something like that. So that's nine years between you. And then your youngest, when, were they, when was they born? She had to be the youngest, 60, 1961, if I can remember, yeah. 
let me do some quick math, <laughs> 25 years. Yeah. So when your oldest sibling was 25, your youngest sibling was born. And that would put yeah. you around, that put you around 14, 15 About 13, years old. 14, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So pretty much every other year, you'd have a new sibling. I did. We, <laughs> <laughs> the neighborhood, you know, every, uh, yeah. we did, I didn't know. Women get, got fat over the summertime or the wintertime. <laughs> every year, the women got fat. And it was, we sit on the porch talking. And I don't know why they would chew Argo starch. Say it again. They would chew Ch starch. Starch. Yeah, it was box. It was in a box and came in. Uh, it was not powder, but like cute uh, chunks of Argo starch. Or you actually start your clothes with. Yeah. You had yeah. to mix it with water. Well, they would chew on that, and I don't know if for the calcium or what reason, but that was a thing back then in the fifties. Women chewed Argo starch. You had to go get me a box of starch. You know, and that while they were pregnant or just in general. When it was pregnant. Okay. Yeah, pregnant women did it. Yeah. Don't ask me why. So as a kid, you just thought women got pregnant over the summer. Yeah, we didn't know it. We didn't know it was pregnancy. We just know how babies were made or anything Mama like that. Mama went to the hospital and came home with another brother or sister. Another one and another one. <laughs> yeah. So to that point, you're thinking everyone has this many brothers and sisters. Because the neighbors were the same way. It was um, the baby boomers. You know, after the war, the people started moving to the people from Texas uh, on went to the West. People from Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia, they went up north. So from my understanding, that's where it happened. My family from Texas, they came west. And uh, the construction, that's what it was, construction workers. Like I said, my father was a musician, so he, I think he brought my mother to Los Angeles. Had to be in the middle 40s, or early 40s. Yeah. And I think they stayed, they went to El Paso, and from El Paso, I think he started going, he's doing the chitlin circuit, playing the blues, right? And so it, when he went to El Paso, I think they started going to Mexico. I think that might have been the problem my father had, you know, swinging down there with the senoritas and stuff, you know. I see. And uh, my mother didn't put up with it, so. As she shouldn't have. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, even though you didn't really live with your father growing up. Did you guys have a good relationship? You did? Oh, yes. You, you did? Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Saw him all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And what about with your mom? Did you have a good relationship with her? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole time, yeah, yeah. I stayed with her too. Until I, until I was like, everybody stayed, everybody left home at 18. Yeah. It was, you know, you didn't stay there. You had to work or go to school. When you're 18, you know, you left. And that's that was a normal thing, especially for the men because of the draft. That uh, 18 years old, you either went to the military, mm -hmm. and most of us could afford to go to college. So we would end up getting a little odd jobs and stuff like that. But basically, everybody, teenagers, went to the military, you know. Yeah. When you think back, what are some of your favorite memories that you have with your parents? Because we would, we had great Christmas because I'm a stepfather of construction workers, so they made good money. Mm. So we had, and my mother, she worked um, different jobs. She worked, I remember she worked at C's for the candy company. And um, so we always had, we were poor, but we weren't poor. You know, yeah. we never went without, we never went hungry. Maybe some hungry, but we always had food, we always had clothes. But uh, the fact that we would, we would go places. We'd go to the parks, we'd go to museums, we'd go to the beach. A lot, a lot of uh, activity with family, uh, different family groups on different holidays or just get them to go to the beach, you know. So you guys were really family oriented. Yeah. You spent time together. You did activities together. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, obviously at that time you didn't realize that not everyone had that many brothers and sisters, but what was it like having so many siblings growing up? Were you close? Tell me about that. Well, I was the fifth. So, yeah. you know, I saw the other ones coming. We didn't have to really take care of them at that young age. They, they were all young. Yeah. You know, um, my two older sisters, they took care of the boys. We were the next line. And then as we got older, my oldest brother had to take care of my younger brother. And then my young, uh, my next my brother next to him, he took care of me. And then I would have to take it, you know, on down the line, you take care of the younger person behind, under mm -hmm. you. So that's, that's how it was, you know. And I'm assuming you guys were in school together or some of you went to different schools? No, I went to the same school, but, you know, year after year, went to the same school. Yeah. Elementary school through, all the way through high school, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
what was school like at that age? Because I, when you and I were driving here today for the interview, one of the most interesting things to me is the difference in technology. And I think people present day, we have this perception of there's phones, there's laptops, there's access to information. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a question, I know we were joking about the pollen in the trees earlier. We could Google that right now and we could find an answer. But back then, you can't do that. So what was what was school like for you guys? Well, really writing and arithmetic. Mm. And we had what we called a weekly reader. It was a, school, a newspaper for students, you know, different levels. And if you know, if you were in the first to third grade, you got this weekly reader, and if you're fourth to sixth grade, you got this level. So we got a lot, a lot of news from the week we call weekly reader in schools. Basically, it was uh, just regular school uh, math, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic. That was it. And then we had what they don't have at school anymore. We had breaks in school every two hours, like nutrition. You go to school it was eight o'clock. Ten o'clock, you would two out. You had fifteen minutes for nutrition. Mm -hmm. Then twelve o'clock, you get thirty minutes for lunch, and then maybe one thirty or two o'clock, it was afternoon nutrition. You get another fifteen minutes to go play. So and that's then, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's all the way through um, through through high school. Yeah, you know, you had a break in between ten, twelve, and two o'clock. You know, and then you had you had gym, you had music. You know, we had things that didn't have in school anymore. Yeah. Know? Everybody had to have pee. We went out and did exercise, except from elementary school all the way through high school. You always had a gym class. And in junior high school, uh, they would have you t what you call shop. You have your regular curriculum, and they, uh, you, uh, you had to take a shop. It was either wood shop, electrical shop, handicraft, or automotive. But what you had to take some kind of class every year. What did you take? All of them. Oh, you took you took all. Oh, mm -hmm. so you could do different ones over the time, but you had to every take every semester. One each year. You know, you get a new one. You know. What was your favorite? Probably, probably handicraft because you got to make different things. You yeah. know, the wallets, the keychains, the uh, play with the plastics and the glues, stuff together. Handicrafts. I wonder why now. I think that might exist in school for some people throughout the world, but it's it's. I don't think that's as prevalent. Nowadays, no. Well, like I said, we had mechanic shop. You know, everybody, everybody wouldn't take a mechanic shop, but we did because we wanted a car. And to get a car back then, ah. you had to be able to hustle and come up with fifty dollars and some kind of way to get a car. And once you got a car, you had to keep it running. Mm -hmm. And to keep it running, they would teach you how to take an engine apart, put it back together. I would brakes on a car, and um, like I said, I had two older brothers, so they would always have a car first. And then, you know, next one get one, then it was my turn to get one. I got hand-me-down cars, but... Yeah. Still a car. Yeah, still a car. <laughs> right, right, right. I had, I had a 1952 Pontiac with no third gear. Stick on the column, right? Yeah. First, you just... First, uh, second, and uh, throw the neutral coast, you know. <laughs> and uh, stuff like that, you know, just things we thought were normal, you know. Yeah. To, to be able to get a car, you had to be lucky or just... Be able to someone give you a car or somebody, you know, it's, uh, you put a car together, you know, go, you and a friend, we get a car together, actually stuff, you know, but uh, that that lasts about, you know, six months or a year. And then as you got older, you get a little job at a hamburger stand, a car wash or something like that. You make a little money and you buy your car. Yeah. yeah. So growing up in Los Angeles, what was okay? So you're going to school. Would it be from seven to two, eight to three? What was, what was the school schedule? Uh, seven to three. Seven to three. And then you need to be on your way home. You know, uh, it wasn't any busing. You went to the local neighborhood school. You walk there. Yeah, you walk. We, um, just if you're out of school, three o'clock. You need to be home by three thirty, and no later than four o'clock, unless you stay for after school programs. And that's what we would do to stay out longer instead of having to go straight home. We would sign up for after school activity, play tag, uh, flag football, or um, go to the weight room. They had a, uh, I was at a brand new junior high school, so they had all the special amenities, you know. Or you, you, they even had what they call agriculture, mm -hmm. you know, in the city, you know, learn how to grow, you know, uh, dig, uh, how to. How to plant vegetables and gardens yeah. and stuff, you know. So valuable skills. Yeah, yeah. Very valuable. Like I skills. said, and you had the wood shop. You make tables, Congo drums, uh, 
your bookcases and stuff like that. Just teach you how to do woodwork. They had metal shop, teach you how to do metal work, you know. And uh, those are the type of class you took all the way through high school. So outside of school and then the extracurriculars outside, uh, after school, what kind of hobbies and interests did you have as a kid and a teenager? Well, most of our hobbies were uh, model airplanes, um, toy soldiers and stuff. We played cowboys, Indians, and war games because mm-hmm. we grew up with uh, the Westerns, uh, the movies, and then we the, the uh, World War II movies. And um, TV had just come out in the uh, late 40s, and we had the TV in the early 50s, 11-inch screen. Black and white? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> color didn't come out until, I guess, um, I guess I had my first color TV. Oh, in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah, I got married in uh, 67, and I don't think, well, color TV was out there, but not everyone had it. You know. That's what I was reading when doing research for this interview. The color TV came out in the 50s, mm-hmm. but that was only in very select places, right. and it hadn't made its way into the American households until the mid-70s. Right, because the technology was for, for color films, but mm-hmm. not for color TV. Exactly. We didn't know that. We just <laughs> that we just didn't have a color TV. You know. So what was it like? So how old were you when you saw a TV for the first time in your home? Oh, it had to be about four or five because we had- uh, What was that like? Well, the TV didn't come on until about two or three o'clock in the afternoon. It was off by eight or nine. And uh, we get to see, you know, early part of the uh, evening, you get to see cartoons. You get to, uh, the, They had uh, Farmer John, Engineer Bill, uh, Popeye. You know, we see those <laughs> programs. And after that, it was- when during the daytime, they had what the soap operas. That's when soap operas came out. So the parents, we they see that we wouldn't because we'd be at school. But our first part of TV, um, seeing TV was after dinner, you know. And um, now they weren't had a TV, so we had one. And we we're, were living in the projects. What we would do, my mother would do, and she'd take the TV and turn it around. And the kids would sit out in front of the in the yard and watch TV. Yeah, we let them watch the. And that's on an eleven inch. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I want people to have this perspective. That's not <laughs> big. You got a whole crowd of people. Yeah. Well, no, they were sitting outside. She turned to the front door. She opened the front door. Okay. And the kids be sitting out in the yard <laughs> and just watching our TV. You know, they were so glad. To, you know, everyone had a TV. So if you had it, you were you were special. <laughs> yeah. A special family. Yeah. Get yeah. all the friends coming over and hanging yeah. out with you guys. Yeah. Um. So growing up, let's see, you're born in 1946. What were some of the challenges that you think you guys faced as a family and just growing up in the 40s and 50s and 60s? I don't know. Um, getting from one part of town to another because we had to, you move from one neighborhood, you're, you're from the Slawsons. You move to this neighborhood, you're from Watts. Well, see, you carry that reputation with you. But by us having older older sisters that had boyfriends, they protected us growing up, you know. Mm-hmm. So we could we can go from any area we want to, and uh, we had no problem with that. Our problem was um, finding something to do. It's nothing to do when you you know. Um, only thing is just to park and go play baseball, play baseball, play football. Yeah, and basketball wasn't very big then. Go swimming, stuff like that. Uh, and what would you say, what were you like as a kid and teenager? Were you- Quiet, timid. Yeah. Yeah, because I always had protection above me. And um, nobody messed with my little brothers or anything because they had a hierarchy to go through. So I was just a, kind of a quiet, timid kid, you know, yeah. stayed around the house. Uh, and then what about, when would you say you got your first job as a kid or teenager? Hmm. Oh, I know when it was my paper route. Mm-hmm. I was um, about 14 years old. Yeah, I got a paper route. 126 papers. I had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, go down there. You had to fold your own papers and rubber band them and get them ready to get get finished on your papers by 7 o'clock before the other kids get up and see that you're the paper boy. You didn't want them to know you were the paper boy. And, Would uh, they look down on you for that? Yeah, I tease you about it, you know. But I got it from a brother. He was a yeah. paper boy. 
And so when he got, I guess, around the ninth, eight, about the eighth grade, or the ninth grade, he didn't want to be the paper boy anymore, so he gave me the route, gave me a bicycle on the route, and I took it over. Sixty dollars a month. That's that's what you made. Six, if and, everybody pays you. <laughs> oh, so you're not getting paid by the company. You're getting paid by the people you're delivering right. to. Right. Then you got to turn your money in. Oh, you got to you got to do everything. Yeah. You got to fold it, deliver it, collect the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> so, were you working every day for that? Yeah. Or mo- yeah. seven days. Seven a week. days a week. Yeah. Sixty yeah. dollars. So about two dollars mm-hmm. a day. Something like that. Yeah. And how long would that route take you? About an hour and a half. Okay. Yeah. But I don't know. You got to do it before school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You had to be at the, yeah. You had to go get the papers, then back, drive, ride back to the neighborhood, throw the papers, and go go home and take a shower and get ready for school. Yep. And uh, then that uh, lasts a couple months. It, I tell you what, it lasts last until one cold winter morning. <laughs> and I just I was trying to deliver these. I was just so cold. I was so cold. Uh, what I did was, you could sell your newspapers. Cars would pass by to buy a newspaper. You had an extra newspaper. You sell, I sold a newspaper for a dime and uh, went to the phone booth and called my mother and told her I was too cold. She said, leave those papers right there. So I took them off and I left. That was it? <laughs> that, was, that was the end of my paper route, yeah. <laughs> that was the end of the job. What yeah. uh, What other jobs did you have after that as, as a teenager and kid? Hamburg stands, work at uh, car washes. You know, you do some, during the summer, but during the um, school year, it didn't really work, you know. You, you be, maybe in the summertime to have something to do, to be able to afford to go to uh, the swimming pool, yeah. you know, to the movie. And uh, it didn't cost the fifteen cent to go to the movie. It didn't cost the fifteen cent to go swimming, but you didn't have the money. Mm. And uh, what we would do, and especially in the summertime when the baseball season was going, they would. Uh, Pay you ten cents for the foul ball if you, you treat the foul balls. Oh, so we gonna hang around the park and a little minor league team, and then foul tips. We run each other down for you till you get get your five balls. You got fifty cents. Yes, that's that's all, uh, that's all you needed for the next. That's the movie. That's the pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got a couple things to do. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, were your were your parents strict on you guys growing up? Yeah, well, we, everybody congregated. Uh, at our house because there's so many of them. I see. So that so was the, we, the hub. Yeah. We, have, we hang, most of the people hang, hung towards our house, if not at our house. So, but yeah, you couldn't go out at night. We wasn't. Said she didn't raise no hoodlums. So we weren't allowed to go out there with the bad boys at nighttime. Yeah. We, right down the porch. But like I said, we had up everything we needed at home. So you got, so the family was so big. You always have people over. You mm-hmm. always have brothers or sisters to hang out with mm-hmm. or your friends. So it's a big family environment. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, what would you say would be the biggest comparison between you as a teenager in those days and then teenagers that you see now? What would you say are the biggest difference that you see? Well, the uh, the ability to get an education. You mm-hmm. couldn't get it back then. You couldn't mm-hmm. afford it back then. And um, like I said, especially with boys, you just thought about you, you're going to be, uh, if you weren't smart enough to go to school or could, could afford to go to school, you went to the military. It was all the, um, all the mad. The girls grew up to be, you know, home, home economics, you grew up to, you know, to be wives, you know, and uh, and that was it. Men be men, girls be girls, you know. We had, um, and we didn't have activity like the record hops, we'd have a, uh, Motown would come on, on Friday nights to different high schools. And they would, um, the Supreme, James Brown, all of them, they would come to uh, go to different schools. On Friday night, they go to yeah. uh, two or three schools. And on Saturday, they go to other schools. That was every Friday. And in junior high school, we had um, Wednesday. It was going to market called Marquis Night. So the, uh, the teenage, younger teenagers, they had to dance on a Wednesday. You know, so we go from like, I guess from about seven to ten. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. A couple hours. So that was the place to be. Yeah. 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 Just learn to skate, learn to dance, and learn to party. <laughs> so, but that's really interesting that you say that about the education. And I didn't think about it that way. So mm-hmm. back then, whatever was available is what you could go to. That's it. You couldn't. It's not that you could even think outside the box because there was n- no other box. No. No, it was just get out of high school and get a job. 
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that was it. It was that college wasn't pushed on us, I guess, in the ghetto anyway. It was uh, learn a trade and get a job. Yeah, you know, survive. Yeah, construction, automotive, uh, what a uh, military. And when you went to the military, you get a career in military. A lot of people. I went for uh, to truck driving. So I joined, I joined the military to go to motor transport to learn how to drive trucks. I wanted to drive mm-hmm. trucks across the country, you know. Could, didn't have trucking school, so you go to the military and learn how to drive. Yeah. yeah. And the older people were encouraged you to go to the military then. Because they know. were already in it? or they Right. right. These guys just came back from uh, World War II. They, their time got, like I said, and um, I don't think they had the GI. I don't know about the GI Bill. I knew about the GI Bill after when I got out. Yeah. But I don't know. They uh, most of the people I knew were in construction, you know. But and you said that was a good paying industry yeah. to be in. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a perfect segue to talk about your experience in the military and then the Vietnam War. Walk me through. I want to set the stage of what was going on in the world at that time. So you let's let's talk about the end of high school. I know you said you didn't graduate. So can you tell me about? What was going on at that time? Were you aware that was the draft already going on then? Oh yeah, the draft had been going on. I knew I was gonna have to sign up at eighteen. Everyone did. What age did you know that? Just all of life. All of life, yeah. Okay. You know, you know uh, well, especially in school, you, you know, you, when you're eighteen, you get the draft card. You get eighteen, you get you know you can get driver's license at fifteen, and you get uh, draft card at eighteen. And um, my, the civil rights movement was going on, but. By being from Los Angeles, we didn't see that much. Yeah. The first time I saw anything about the Civil Rights Movement was Martin Luther King's uh, March on Washington, August 63. That's the first time I've ever seen an event with the, you know, about the Civil War. And then, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Civil Rights Movement. Civil Rights Movement. Then I started seeing uh, documentaries, so I seeing film, and then putting the dogs on people, and they're talking about Emmett Till being hung. Those things were... Well, Till was back in um, elementary school, really. And uh, got that in the weekly reading. You did a lot of, you, you read a lot of newspapers mm-hmm. and you watched, nobody wanted to watch the news. You go watch uh, a TV program and then we go outside and play. So. I see. And that, I think it's really important for people to understand there's no social media back then. Right. There's no internet. No. There's no TV. No. The When you read something off of a newspaper, it's very different from seeing a video and seeing it in real life. Mm-hmm. And also, if you're in Los Angeles, that's 3,000 miles away right. from Atlanta, right. where a lot of it, a lot of things are happening. Um, and I know when I was talking to you in the way here, you, you said you weren't even aware of the deep racism in mm-hmm. the South in comparison to, to LA. No. Was, was there racism that you experienced as a child and teenager growing up in LA? Not really, because we didn't, we didn't go to the white neighborhoods. I see. So where you grew up is all black neighborhoods. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you have any white friends? No, Mexican. Blacks and Hispanics grew up together. So it, it was segregated. Oh then, yeah, too. very segregated. You just you didn't go across Alameda, or you didn't go across Maine. You didn't go. You had boxes to go to. But like I said, uh, by us getting cars at a young age, we could always drive to where we want to and get back, you know, safe and sound. But uh, we caught the, caught the bus, bus in the streetcar, but we never stopped in a white neighborhood, you know. That would be dangerous? I don't know. You just never did it? Never did it, you know. <laughs> he had the boundary. And that was just, I'm, re- I'm just processing this as I'm hearing it because... I guess where you're, what you're born into really shapes how you think about about the world. So for you guys, that was just how life was. We had everything we wanted. I mean, you, not everything, but you know, you did didn't want for anything. Um, we may not had everything, but you were always able to. You can go to the movie. You can go downtown. You can go. Uh, you can go. They had movie theaters in the neighborhood. We had parks and recreation. You know, we had. Uh, Things it always had things for us to do, just would be wanting to do it, you know. And like I said, sports was the biggest, uh, a lot of it. And when you got older, it was ch- chasing in girls through the park. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, growing up, okay. So if you're in an all black neighborhood, but you're also uh, you have Mexican friends, mm-hmm. 
sports, is it all black teams? There's no, yeah. mm-hmm. there's no integration. No, no, not at all. No, not at all. We weren't even eligible. Our teams uh, weren't even eligible for, uh, we just were eligible for Pop Warner, let alone to have the Little League World Series. I don't even know when that started, you mm-hmm. know. But we'd have our, we have our neighborhood rivalries and it was, we were against mostly black teams, you know. Yeah. And um, we might have a jersey and, and jeans. And if you did play a white team, they had the full uniform and they're pretty, you know. They'd have, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's all right. We had the sticks. We had, we had, we had the athletes. Yeah. We had good, good, good athletes, you know. Bad equipment, but good athletes. Good athletes. That's what matters. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So growing up, then you, mu- you must have seen your, your family members be drafted. Your yes, your older brothers. Mm-hmm. Well, no, my, no, they wouldn't go. They didn't <laughs> they, go. They dodged the draft. How'd they dodge it? Well, my oldest brother, he actually, he actually was the first one to go to Pepperdine University. Okay. So he went as a conscientious objector, and um, my other brother, he he failed the entry exam, and they called him in the office and said, "How did you fail?" The entry exam to go to the mil- you can't fail this. What kind of test was it? Aptitude test, just okay. you know, you couldn't fail it. Very, very easy. <laughs> yeah, very easy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they kicked him out of there. You know, and I wanted to go, you know, just because it wasn't anything doing the streets. My best friends had left. Uh, one of them moved back to Frisco. The other moved back to Louisiana. And like I said, I wasn't allowed to hang with the hootlums. And the first time, first time I did, I like they got arrested, uh, breaking into, breaking into this little liquor store. And what did we steal? We stole cigarettes, Marlboro cigarettes. We stole Fritos and beer. How Case, old were you then? Sixteen. Okay. Sixteen. The first time you're hanging out with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That summer when uh, no seventeen. I was I just I turned seventeen. Yeah, and uh, I stopped going to school. When Kennedy got killed in 63, that's when I dropped out of school altogether. I was just, I, I was just disgruntled. I didn't want to go to school anyway. And let's tell you what happened. My mother moved to uh, the, the, the ghetto. She moved from Watts to uh, what's now uh, the part of Los, uh, South Central Los Angeles, we were the third black family on that street. Wow. And they sent me to all white school. Oh That's God. where my problem was to end up going to school. I never went to school with whites before. They, my brother was a senior and a track star and a football star, so they let him stay. But they forced me to go to the high school with the white kids. And I got into a fight and um, smoking in the bathroom. And these uh, hall monitors, they would, they would set me up, you know, to jump on me in the in the bathroom. So at that time, they had real mirrors in the bathroom and real metal cans. And when they came in and told all the, all the white boys to leave, and I was in there by myself, and the only thing I could do is fight my way out. I just grab a trash can and start swinging. Well, broke up the mirrors, broke up the trophy case, went through the senior plot. And uh, I thought they, would, I thought they just didn't like me because I was black, you know. And uh, and I that's after that I didn't want to go to school there anymore. So they set you up to fight you, to beat you yeah, up in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sent all the little white boys out, you know. Uh, and they were going, you know, they're going to jack me up in the bathroom, but just because you were black. <laughs> yeah, I was the fortieth black to go to <sighs> school. Washington High School I was the fortieth black to go there in nineteen sixty three. At lunchtime, they gave me a standing ovation, you know. So, and I would never been, I'd never been around white people before, I, you know, not growing up with them. Yeah. You know, and uh, obviously, it, the fact even hearing about the racism, it just hurts my heart to even hear that, that that went on. Um, what were you thinking going into that? Because obviously, you knew the white community at that time did not like black people, but mm-hmm. did you guys feel that same way? You just, we well, know. I mean, you know, you don't. You didn't go to the white neighborhoods. You didn't go to yeah. white. You didn't have to go to white school. You had your own schools, you know. And uh, by as a mother moved inside of the neighborhood into this white neighborhood, virtually white. Which, uh, Why? Why did she do that? Because we, she, well, well, I, I think my um, 
my father's Social Security came in. And so she got money for uh, my, myself and my two brothers. She was I able see. to afford, a, a, I think it was the house was $16,000 then. I don't know how much she got, but she was able to actually move us. We no longer had to rent. She was able to buy us a house. It happened to be in a white neighborhood, but, you know, she was moving us out of the, you know, the ghetto. And that's, that was That's a, why. Yeah. So you um, move into the white neighborhood. You have to go to the white school. Right. How long were you at the school? Oh, six months. Oh, so you were there for, for a little while. No, nah, you... not really. <laughs> I was half going. Oh, you weren't really... even showing up. You, yeah. you were enrolled at the school, right, but you weren't, you right, weren't going. Right, right, yeah. And it was in the summer, and I missed the, I missed the uh, summer practice for football, and track wasn't coming up until January. So um, I didn't make it to January, yeah. Like a, a November, I think that was the fall. You, like, that was seventeen. You dropped out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you dropped out, was there backlash from your parents, or what happened? With what did they say? Well, you get a job. You got it. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go get a job. Yeah. You gotta, yeah, because you either work or went to school. You prefer you do both. So you get your little job at a hamburger stand, a car wash, or something. You know, uh, newspaper days were over with, and um, just did whatever you could to earn some money. And because and, and like I said, I tried to I tried to join the military at seventeen and a half. My mother wouldn't sign for me. She said, "When you're eighteen, you can do what you want to." So, so you wanted to go into the military? Yeah, at that I time. wanted to get out the streets. Okay, I misunderstood this. You were not drafted into Vietnam immediately when you joined the military. I never had a draft card. You get your draft card when you're eighteen. I see, but you joined when yeah. I when I turned um, eighteen. I went down to recruiters office and joined. I see. Okay, and that was to do uh, truck driving. I did, did. Yeah, I didn't tell you anything. You know. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, I want to be. <laughs> I want to go to motor transport. Okay, we got you signed up for motor transport. You know, whether or not it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you go down there to the recruitment office at eighteen. Mm-hmm. You sign up. Was that the Marines at that time, or what were you? What were you signing up for? Then? Marines. Uh-huh. Marines. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, they had um, a little poster out there. His blue uniform, the rugged jaw, you know. And like I said, we grew up with war stories, so we saw we saw war movies, you know. Uh, so you the the media, everything around you was about war. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes. So was, this sounds like a weird statement, but that was almost a way to be included, is you were a part of that. Right, right. So you had World War Two, then you had Korea, and so it, the, when was Korea? What? Korea's fifty to fifty two. Okay. Yeah, see, and uh, so that's works, when yeah. that's when my uh, my older sisters, their boyfriends, were going to uh, the military. So you always see a uniform around. Some of the, the, and they because they look good in the uniform, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. And there's a respect and a respect, yeah, mm-hmm. that goes along with that. Okay, so you sign up for the Marines at 18. What happens from there? Well, <laughs> my military career was actually kind of short. I only did two years, ten months, and twenty two days. Went to training, went to boot camp, 12 weeks of boot camp and four weeks of advanced and feature training. Came home for Christmas. And then uh, uh, January 65, we formed the 1st Marine Division. And uh, we started training for conventional warfare because this is right after um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm-hmm. And then they went to, the Marines went to San Domingo. That was in 65. And uh, we were training to fight Russians. So we did, we trained for conventional warfare, no jungle warfare. And um, finally, in August, we weren't supposed to go overseas until January of the year. But in May, the Bay of Tonkin, and that started everything. That started the Vietnam War when they attacked uh, um, the um, American ships in, uh, in Hanoi Harbor. So that started... To, they start uh, shipping Marines out. One um, who who attacked? I'm not as familiar with that with the bay. The um, we had ships patrolling Hanoi Hanoi Harbor, and it's a place called the Bay of Tonkin. They attacked one of our ships, and they, they, we declare well, we didn't declare war. We were supporting the South South Vietnamese government. Yeah. And when that broke out, and that's when they uh, start sending troops to Vietnam. That was the excuse. That's it's, May of '65. Mm-hmm, around May, yeah, yeah. So you had you had joined not even a year prior. 
Right. You're going through the training. You mentioned the training for conventional warfare, and this right. is important to differentiate between the two. Mm -hmm. What is conventional warfare? House to house, building to building. It wasn't no huts or anything. It was like combat town was a, a, a town built. Like a city. A city. So you go in there and you, uh, you jump from window to window, go upstairs and stuff like that, and check out basements and kick down doors. And uh, so that's where, how we train. Well, we came back. Um, we were sta I was stationed in San Diego, Coronado, uh, where the SEALs trained. At that time, they were called UDT, Underwater Demolition. So we thought we had it bad as Marines training. And we saw these suckers walk, running around with telephone poles, soaking wet. Oh, my God. Just treading water, you know. And we thought we were good. But they, was, they were outstanding. They were another level. They were another level. And while we're training um, reserves how to drive in combat conditions on Sacramento Island, we're supposed to be at three weeks. They called us back in two weeks, and we didn't know what was going on. But when we got back to Camp Pendleton, all our gear, trucks, armor vehicles, tanks, everything on the grinder, just spread all out the whole camp. And we knew then something was coming up, and they told us we were going to Okinawa. Mm. And... Uh, was a boy ship and we went in um we loaded the ship the ship uh, almost 2,000 men with all our gears and supply and next thing I know we were headed we were headed to Vietnam we were headed to Okinawa so they said and when is this this is the summer of 65 August 10th we left uh um, left 10th. port August 10th two days before my 18th birthday but before my 19th birthday I um had my 19th birthday boy ship that was the day the Watts Riot started, back in uh, 1960. The what started? The Watts Riot. The Watts Riot. Yeah, the first time I heard, we missed it by two days. What is the Watts Riot? The riot, it was a riot in Watts, the city of Watts. Oh, Watts Riot. Watts Riot, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, we went to, went from there, we went to Hawaii for a day, then went to Okinawa, and we started junk, that's when we started our first, part of the jungle warfare fighting, we realized we're going to the jungle and not to Russia. And uh, so I was in a floating battalion and uh, we left by ship and we stayed aboard ship. And we would go uh, we'd, uh, go to the coast of Vietnam and then we'd get, get in these landing crafts and then we'd make a raid on the beach, uh, really a blocking force, you know, we, was, uh, we were boots. So they're using us for blocking force, no, no, no major events. But as we stayed there and we went back and forth to the Philippines, we flowed off the coast and we were back to Vietnam on a mission, an operation, be there for two two weeks or so, running through the jungles, just chasing them all through the, uh, chasing the Viet Cong all through the jungle. Had no idea where they disappeared to until we started finding these spider traps and these, um, these, mouse, these mouse holes, you know, where they would hide at. We found out they were underground tunnels they were leading all through the mountains, and that's oh why that's why we couldn't find. Them. They fired us, and we take off chasing through the jungle and couldn't find them. So they'd attack you. You try to fight back. They disappeared. Disappeared on us, yeah. So, oh my god! So a lot of that went on. So clearly, what you guys were trained for was not what actually <laughs> happened <laughs> exactly. at all. No. Uh, yeah. And again, you don't even know what you're going into. No. Because there's no internet, there's no media. Uh, okay, so what What did you, okay, you mentioned the floating, so many questions. Floating battalion. Yeah. Tell me what that means. You stayed aboard ship okay. from August to January. and You, you never, didn't touch the ground? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah we were land, we were going oh. on landings. Oh, but you're going from port to port. Port to port, right. Okay. We go, uh, go to the Philippines for a week or two. And that does for jungle warfare tra survival training, and um, then we they call us to Vietnam. You know they cut everything short. We sent us back to Viet. Somebody got attacked, or they started the operation, and uh, we went by air, land, or sea. Sometimes we'll be Amtrak, sometimes be on helicopters, and sometimes just uh, beach landing crafts. So we just we make a raid, go in there for a week or two, sometimes just for a day or two. You know, and. Uh, go back, recuperate, and just do the same thing over and over again. When you say make a raid, explain to me what, what you're doing during that time. Well, 
you load up with ammo, grenades and, and, and uh, bullets, and you, you load up on a boat and you take the beach. You know, you go make a landing. And I said, Ray, you make a landing. Sometimes the land, it would land by sea. That would be in the mic boats. And that would just take us to the beach, open that door, and it just go out. Door drops down on the sand. You yeah. guys come rushing and, out. Yeah. What was, do you remember your first raid? Or do we, because I guess in my mind, I can't even, <laughs> I cannot even fathom going through this. When I was 18 or 19, I was fighting in a martial arts tournament with pads on my feet. <laughs> you're, and you're not allowed to hit in the face. Uh -huh. So it's very, I can't even fathom what it's like for someone that age to have, I think you said 120 pounds worth of gear. Oh yeah. That's uh, and you're going into something where people are dying yeah. and you're killing people or you're getting killed. Yeah. So did you, at, before your first raid, did you know what to expect before going into that? No. So that was a man, shock to yeah. your... Man, you, 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 would t you never know what it's like until the bullet comes at you. When you hear that first bullet or the first bomb go off, that's when, you, that's when you're nervous. You get nervous for the landing, but when you hear that first shot, shot or that first time bullet buzz by your ear, that's, that's entirely, entirely different thing. <clears throat> you know, training is one thing. But when you when they tell you, you take that beach and that door opens up and you can hear the uh, bullets pinging off the side of the ship, you know, or, or kicking up dirt in front of you, you know, like I said, you just start, take off running, you know, can't go backwards, so you had to keep going forward. And we mm -hmm. thought we were the baddest train, the best train, the well equipped, best equipped, which we were compared to the Viet, the Viet Cong, not the North Vietnamese. So we we're, we we're fighting the guerrillas, you know. Okay, that thank you for bringing that up. That can you explain the difference and who you were fighting against? We were fighting the guerrilla tactics. So, like I said, we were, we were mobile. We can go anywhere. So we we weren't uh, stay, we weren't, uh, didn't have a base camp. Our base was the boy's ship, and where we landed. That's well, the base was the ship. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. yeah, and for however long we landed. Depending on what the operation called for, it caused it to move forward and go farther inland. Or sometimes it was just get on the beach and hold the beach until they come pick you up. You know? So during these raids, you're told by your is what would be the correct terminology? Is so is someone in charge of you? Your leader of a battalion? Who who is in, who is leading these? these? A, a lieutenant, a, lieutenant. I mean, a, a platoon leader. Platoon leader. We okay. all, we're, we're going on a mission tomorrow. Load up. You know, and every platoon, every squad, every company had the same order, you know. When the, the whole battalion, you know. You five different companies, you know. Um, Echo, Hotel, Golf, Foxtrot, and then the headquarters of ports. So four companies, about 90 men, 90 to 125 men, and a, and a company. And... and Going into these battles, especially the first raid, you you said training's one thing, but when you hear that first bullet or bomb go off, what's what's going through your mind? Because I, I feel like I'd be scared shitless yeah, and I'd well, crap my pants. Yeah, don't get shot. <laughs> don't get shot. Don't get blowed up. <sighs> Just take that hill. And everybody else is doing the same thing. We're running, running, running towards the objectives, you know. And are, are you seeing people, are your brothers, is there any women in the military at this time or no. this is all men? My, they were milked, but not in the field. Okay, not in the field. So no. this is all men in the field. Are you seeing people that you came there with be shot and killed? Is this? Not so much at first, but they start happening because the operations kept picking up and getting larger and larger. They started putting us in, in more, um, more. we were, I guess, battle-hardened by then. You know, after your first two raids, you're Marine then, you're full-fledged soldiers. You're you fighting survive. Shit. Yeah, yeah, you survive. And um, usually you hear about somebody else's other company getting shot or getting hit. And then when it starts happening to you, it, that kind of bothers you then. Yeah. Because you see that person, you know, you've been training with them for a year. And all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. You know. What is the adrenaline rush going through your body like? Because I can imagine, uh, let me rephrase, I can't imagine what it's like. But when you have adrenaline rushing through your body, but then it tapers down. How are you, how do you deal with the stress and the anxiety of being in war? Just hoping the shooting stop 
hope you can uh, put enough firepower out there on them and uh, rush them far enough back into the bush into another blocking unit to be able to, you, then you calm down. You don't calm down until you calm down. You know, it's, uh, once they stop shooting at you or once you stop having a, into, an incoming artillery or grenades coming at you, you you'll slow down. You know. And how long could you be under fire or in a battle? in a period of time? Because I said, you know, it might be a day or two, you might be there for a couple of weeks, but when these battles are going on, how long could they last? Not very long. You know, um, 20, 30 minutes maybe, you know, then it then it uh, spreads out and maybe the next day or a couple hours later it might happen to your flank, to your right flank, to the left flank, and, um, and then it might happen to your unit, you know, all of a sudden some snipers, uh, there's a lot of sniper fire. Not, 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 there wasn't a lot of hand-to-hand combat, and you actually see the enemy. You know, you see the muzzle blast. I see, okay. Yeah, it was from a distance. So, I see now. So, the, the purpose of the guerrilla warfare was to hide and protect yourself from getting hit right. while you're attacking th- their enemy, which would be, would right. be you guys. Mm-hmm. So, they had a major, major advantage. Advantage, yeah. It us down. They stole a whole battalion. Well, two men stole a whole battalion down, you know. Because they know the it, whole terrain. right. We don't know where they came from. Don't know where they went. So you could be walking through the jungle, and all of a sudden you hear a bullet whiz past. Mm-hmm. You look, there's nothing there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, like I said, uh, you never hear the one that hits you, hit you, but you always hear the one that miss you, because if you hear it, it already passed by you. Yeah, that's that's the thought you had. Once you heard the shot, it was you. They missed you. Yeah. Um. How do you, how do you process the fear, and how do you not let the fear control you from, I guess, running away and, and leaving? Where are you gonna go? <laughs> go where? <laughs> Run where? <laughs> you gonna leave all these men to go back to the beach? Nah, you couldn't do that. You could, I mean, just was inconceivable. You know, you just didn't do that. You know, you stuck together, brotherhood. You know, you were my best friend. I was your best friend. Didn't care what color you were. We all had the same thing. M14 rifles and plenty of ammo. And our objective, to go get them. You know, go get them. Yeah. You didn't have a choice. No. That was it. Go get them or are they coming to get you? Kill or be killed or yeah. survive or don't survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thinking about the day-to-day of, because it's not, obviously, the, the, the actual raids and warfare is terrible, but then you've got the living conditions. Mm-hmm. What are you eating? And what are you eating, and how are you sleeping during the this sea time? Sea rations in the field. Sea rations. In, okay. Yeah, just sea rations, canned food, or, and that was it. You know, get three boxes of sea rations every couple of days, and um, we learn to survive and eat out of that. You did. We didn't eat. We were trained to eat um, in, in jungle warfare. We never had to do that because we were always so close to going back. You know, so we always had hot meals coming somewhere pretty soon. But uh, if, we, if we were out there more than a week, they would pass you to send some uh, more Got food. <laughs> you know. And are you? You guys have tents on you. What are you using to sleep? That's at? Uh, yeah. That's when you had the full field transport pack. That's uh, called shelter here. But most time we didn't. Um, most of the time we didn't have that. We didn't carry that much because too much to carry through the jungle. So we eventually dropped us. Drop the tent rolls and the, uh, the other half of the pack in the sleeping bag. We just stopped carrying that. And we, we go with what they call a light marching pack, which is change of clothes, you know, and and food, you know, and grenades. So travel light. You've got your weapons. You've got yeah. your clothing. A yep. little bit of food. Mm-hmm. And you're moving. Are you guys staying in one place at a time? Or are you moving each night? You're moving around? Um, yeah, we moved around quite a bit. We didn't stay in the one position because they, they key in on you. So... If we stayed here tonight, we didn't stay there the next night. Yeah. Mm. Not until after we landed, we, uh, we got off the ship and we landed uh, up in Fubai, in Waste City. But uh, first six months, first five months, we were just, we would, um, most time we'd spend in Vietnam at a time would be about two weeks. You know, most times it's three or four days. And how are you able. How are you able to sleep at night? Even relax. Like, can, can you? Are you guys have people watching? You take yeah. shifts. Okay, yeah, take shifts. Four on and four off. You know, every other man. 
could you sleep or would it be, is it yeah, just too yeah, much stress? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you slept. You slept. You, I mean, real lightly, but you slept. You're probably so tired from the whole day. Yeah, from running, running through the mud, slipping and sliding through the rice paddies, getting shot at and taking cover and taking. Oh my God. Every time you get to the top of a hill, there's another hill, you know, so it's steady moving. And then once you dig in, you're tired. You just, you know, hope to get some sleep. Yeah. But, is it raining a lot there and oh, hot mon- weather? Monsoon, yeah. So you, it, you're, it's muggy, muggy and sweaty yeah. and wet. Yeah. You're getting shot at. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it was so bad that a uniform was right off of it. So within a week's time, you oh know. Oh, my God. I wasn't went getting caught in these um, these bushes and these thorn bushes. We call wait a minute bushes. You couldn't add the thorns, a hook. And uh, that's where the enemy would set up uh, traps at. Going around a curve or a bend, you would have uh, – a machine gun opened up on you, so you take to the bushes. What's the wait a minute bush? You can't get through it. You have to actually pull the thorns out and go back around. So now oh you're back in the open. So, <sighs> so it's just one bad thing after the other, yeah. another obstacle. Yeah. You avoid uh, someone shooting you. Mm-hmm. You run into a trap. Yeah. yeah. You try to find the people that shoot you. They're disappeared. Yeah. So tell me about that when you guys started discovering their secret tactics. We started paying attention to the ground. You had to look around, find that little piece of mesh that's sticking up. That's a tunnel. Everybody get back. And uh, there want, could be someone in there. Yeah, most of uh, most of the time, yeah, you know. But uh, some of them are fighting holes, and some are actual tunnels that led off to different areas. How how vast were these tunnels? How mm-hmm. big? How big were these tunnels? Oh, what uh, enough for you to get into? Or sorry, were they connected? Like, how long are we talking? Uh, well, ten, 10 feet, to, fifty feet, or yeah, something like that. Um, ten to twenty feet. You know, th- those are the fighting holes mostly. You know, they would attack from there, but some of them would actually branch off uh, from you know hundreds of meters. You know, no, those are the deep ones, really up, really, really up in the jungles. They would um, they would find those. Basically, we fought most, found mostly fighting holes, you know, which would dingle more than 10 or 15 feet. But you had to go in there with a, you take a 45 and a flashlight with the, with the magnet on it, and you go in the hole, you know, to look, go to search the hole. Well, I didn't like that. So, no. Well, no, I'd take a grenade, throw the grenade down the hole. Boom, find the hole. Wilkins said, go clear that hole. Yes, sir, now I'll go. Yeah, well, clear the hole. No, because if someone's in there, they're going to shoot you before you shoot them. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But we had some guys who were bold enough to go down there. Hit first. They couldn't wait to get down that hole. Yeah. Papa, it's just, it's, I can't even fathom, I mean, the the strength and the courage that you guys had. Thank you for, I just thank you for your service and thank you for your courage. And I I just can't even fathom. I, I mean, they say courage. I was nominated for a bronze star when I got shot because I went to take care of my sergeant who had got shot, who was taking care of my corporal who had got shot, oh my God. you know, and uh, we were just taking care of each other. It wasn't courage, it was survival. That's what it was, survival. Get over that next hump and get through that next rice paddy and uh, stop them just shooting at you. That's it. So in that moment, you're not thinking, there's no thought of courage. It's, I just, I want to survive and I want my brothers to survive. Exactly. Can you, can you share that story with us of, of, of how you got shot? Okay. This, uh, on March 4th, 1966, I got, when in January, McLemore started transferring troops around, started, uh, that sending the older troops, breaking up units. And started the rotation of people starting going home. Instead of sticking it with the, then they stay with the people that we train with, it were breaking units up. Well, they sent me from Wei Fu Bai, which is DMZ, to Chu Lai, which is a um, helicopter base and a real dangerous area down the, down uh, down southern Vietnam, farther south there than what I was. We were, to, we were in the far north near the DMZ. So the next big city, oh, down was too light. Well, this is a hot area. And uh when I went to that went from two ones to uh Fox Track two seven. Well, this unit, every time we went to this village, we get attacked. 
and we had to run run through the jungle chasing them. And every week, the attacks got harder and heavier and heavier. So we started taking more troops in there. This final time, we realized that we had landed to a, at the middle of a North Vietnamese regiment headquarters. Oh, my God. They landed us right in the middle of it. So they suckered us in. We're firing little shots at us, and all of a sudden, everything opened up. Everything. I mean, just bombs just falling, guys just holes, the people popping out of holes, and we're just shooting and shooting and just running towards towards this uh, open field. Well, it was a hedge line about 50 meters across. And so we fired to the hedge line. As soon as we got to the edge of the rice paddy, the whole hedge line disappeared. Through camouflage that well, I mean, now we're in the open, open field, and um, that when they st- people just start getting hit right next to me, you know, it's just I saw um, a shell hit a guy right in the helmet, he disappeared, just smoke, just gone. Another guy get hit, you could hear him howling all over the place, and we just everybody was getting hit. Well, they had they had us in a horseshoe. They were trying to surround us. And if we would have kept going forward instead of settling in, they would have had us in a horseshoe. They would have annihilated us. We were outnumbered 10 to 1. Didn't know it at that time. And uh, that was, at that time, that was the largest operation that the Marines had ever been in, had been in Vietnam. And they had us, if it hadn't been for the Phantom Jets and the Huey helicopters laying that napalm down, we would have been in a world of trouble. You know, so that's what saved us. They, uh, Came in treetop level, and um, I heard the fire team leader. He he got shot, and the sergeant told me take over because it was only eight of us, and uh, it was from, it was a fourteen man squad. Now it's only eight of us, so he told me to keep him down, keep him down. Then I heard him holler. He got shot, so I told the next guy next to me, keep him here, keep him here. And I went back and I saw the, the corporal was shot in the left thigh, and the sergeant was shot in the knee. So I went to go change the bandage, and I saw a, a flicker of light come out of the hole. So I took a grenade, threw in the hole, and waited for it to go out. It didn't go off. So I think, well, the dud. So I went to go t- uh, put a bandage on my uh, on the, uh, the corpus thigh because a big hole in his leg. And uh, just as I went to tear the bag open, bam, the grenade went off. When the grenade went off, I got hit. And back it on, it blew me up off the ground. I caught my arm, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I holler, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And uh, can I hold up for a minute? Can I wait for a minute? Can we pause this for a minute? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, got kind of nervous talking about it. No, that, it's okay. We can, yeah. <clears throat> it was happening so fast. Yeah, you know, no, Papa, and, sorry. Uh, and, and if there's anything you don't want to talk about, we don't. Mm, it's all right. Sorry, I, I was. Mm. <laughs> fully listening in the it, it was just you know there was just so much going on at one I mean this was every this I never seen anything like that in my life it was they were all over us and they were just all over yeah, the place yeah we can we can they were falling just like we were falling and uh, like I said we wanted to put our backs against the wall and just held them off when I got shot <laughs> I grabbed my arm and said I'm shot I'm shot I'm shot so he's, and um, so the other guy that I told him to stay back he came to see about me well, he gets hit, and I see a muzzle blast come from a tree for about about 75 yards away. Was just seen about 50 yards, maybe, up in the tree. I said, there he is, there he is, there he is. And he's up in the tree, a sniper. Well, shot in the right arm, my right handed. I took my rifle, got my rifle, and tried to fire. It was on automatic. <laughs> it flew out my hand. Well, then he really opened up. Dun, 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 dun. I could see the bullets coming and just... It stopped right here. So my sergeant told me, get him, get him, get him. He gave me M79 grenade launcher. And I just, I only fired it one time. Just aimed it, boom, and it just exploded. I seen his helmet fly off and the chains, he was chained to a tree full of opium. And it just blew him apart. And that was it for that, you know. After that, now we got to get back out of this open field. I'm hitting on an arm, and um, sergeant's hitting the kneecap, 
So, but we gotta get across this field. The other guy, he just, this, I don't know where that, but he's just laying there. And the guy that came to see about me, he kept trying to get up and we couldn't make him stay down, stay down, stay down. Well, kind of, and the next thing you know, blood was coming out of his mouth and he wasn't moving again. The bullet, I found out the bullet had ricocheted off his hip, of his pelvis, and uh, punctured his lungs. He drowned his own blood. So, little things like that was happening, like I said. Boom, 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 boom. Now we got to run across this big open field. I made the core and give me some morphine because I was panicking. Give me yeah. some morphine. Give me some morphine. So he said, shut up. I take care of this guy. Take care. So now he told me, now we got to go across this back to this open field. So they took my rifle, cut the flag jacket off me. And so he would go across this field and there's morphine and kicking in. Well, this machine gun opened up, and dun, 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 you can see the mud just kicking off, off the dikes of the rice paddy coming behind us. Well, we picked up our step a little bit, you know, and we made it across that open field, and and uh, I just laid it for a while. We hit the beach, hit, hit the deck, and uh, they put me on a stretcher. The stretcher was a, a door from a village, and one of the huts that got blew up, so they put me on this door and uh, just waited for the that's when the, the phantom just started coming in. Boom, 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 boom. Just, you can feel the canisters of napalm coming out. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And then the whole area just warm up. Boom. Just this wall of fire. And that's what kept us get, from getting overran. That was my last day of combat. Very hurt. I, I can't, I, I don't even have words. Yeah. I don't even have words. Like I said, I was just, I don't either. You know, just, just remember. And that was the most horrible uh, time in, that I had in the military. You know, that day I got shot, you know. Yeah. Because all, all, everything else was leading up to that. Same thing happened, but I didn't get shot. <laughs> you know, so. And not, you said not just that, but every, almost everyone on your team that day yeah. was hit or injured, killed four, or injured. Four of us in one spot. Four of us. So, but you had fourteen that day. No, eight. Eight of you, and yeah, but when I first got there, it was fourteen. Got it. Several weeks before, so we'll lose one here, we'll lose one there. Maybe a punji snake might be a, might somebody might get sick or whatever. You know, a guy rotated out. But by the time we got to that battle, it was only eight of us in the squad. That should have been fourteen. Wow. So that was your last day in combat, yeah. and you're sh- I can't. I, your arm and shoulder is mangled at that. Do you well, have any, any, do you have any room? Back, it blew out my bicep. So, and I had to hook the thumb to the wrist, the wrist to the forearm, this finger to this finger, that finger, that, just so I could do that. Yeah. Ten in operations and stuff like that. About five operations total. How old were you then, Papa? I was home before I was 20. I was just <laughs> so... So this was all at 19. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I had my oh, 19th birthday God. on my way over, and I was home before I was 20. I got home in April. Yeah, around April of so 66. This isn't like you're seven. in the war for years. I mean, this mm-hmm. is an insane amount of tragedy and, and destruction in a very short period of yeah. time. From August to, uh, to March, April, to August to April. Not even a year. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So after you were shot and you're put in the stretcher, what happens after that? Are you taken back to the ship? Well, they try. <laughs> first of all, the first helicopter came to pick us up. It was the sun had just went down, and uh, so they're trying to load us on these uh, <clears throat> these helicopters. Well, <laughs> as they were putting me in the door. A mortar round hit the tail of the helicopter. Oh so God. now, woo, woo, we're just going up and just, just take it. Definitely dropped us. I mean, the, the guys dropped me and it went in a ditch. And the helicopter just went up. It was just going up in circles, just over in smoke. So we laid down. They called the phantoms back in, the phantom jets back in, and laid down some more napalm. And, this, and the, they were, because they, they were in our perimeter. So they had to fight and get the guys out of the perimeter. We call them gooks out of the perimeter. And uh, for about an hour, another helicopter came. And uh, this time it got me on there. So the first helicopter, you're almost 
killed in that one yeah, and that it's blown one, yeah. up. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. And I remember laying in the ditch upside down because this I'm, I slid off this board, right? And the helicopter, I'm watching this helicopter just go back up and it was going up in smoke. And for yeah, if I'd have been on there, if it, if we got on there, I might have, I don't know if it crashed or not. I can't remember. Did you think you were going to die that day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I was going to die as soon as I got shot, you know. Didn't know. I thought my arm was blown off. Could you, did you know what happened at that moment or your adrenaline was so high you just, you felt the pain? and it, was, it, it just knocked it up in the air because, remember, it broke the bone. So this was open. And it looked, when I, when I fell on my stomach, I thought my, I was moving my shoulder and my hand wasn't moving. The arm wasn't working. Right. So and I thought, I said, they blew me up. They blew it off. They blew it off. When I rolled over, I realized I still had it. But this happened within, like I said, all within minutes. So, oh, so this is this is all going on in a very short time. It started time. about, our landing started about 5 or 6 o'clock that morning. I got shot about 1 and... Um, I didn't get met back to about eight o'clock, nine o'clock that night. Oh my god! Yeah, so all that time. After your are vacked out, after the the second helicopter gets you guys mm -hmm. out, is that back to the ship? No, we went to Danang, to, uh, to Danang Hospital. No, we we had been off ship then. Okay, we landed in in uh, Wei Fu Bai back in January, and we st uh, that's where we were stationed at. That's when I first found out about the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And and uh, standing point in the DMZ, you know, just uh, it was a lot of just waiting around, looking down in the valley, and watching them get a, move around and at nighttime, going patrols and stuff like that, search and destroy. Kind of scary, but that's what we did. You know, go find a trail, pick them up, call artillery in, or either just wait on the ambush. Hope 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 we can ambush them before they ambush us. So we yeah. did a lot of that in January. February, that's when I got transferred down south, you know. So that was it from the ship to the from the ship to the jungle, straight in the stadium. Straight, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're shot, and then you have these surgeries. Um, do you have to stay there? How it's, long between that and then you coming back home? Twenty days. Okay. The infection rate was so high they wouldn't let you come back to the states for twenty for three weeks to make sure you're not infected so you don't spread it to other people. Right. Yeah. So, and, uh, and that's just had to do dressings change every, you know, once a week. We did take a handful of Q-tips and stick from the back of your arm all the way through. Uh, you hate, hated Thursdays because that's oh when they clean God. your wound, you know. And uh, after that, it was just uh, coming back to the States and healing up. And uh, had, that's when I started having the surgeries, you know, one after another because they hadn't seen wounds like that since Korea. Armor piercing rounds, and um, um, so they weren't prepared. The, the um, our medical units weren't ready for it. You know, the ammunition was different. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the uh, armor piercing, the um, the heavier rounds, um, Russian M ones, um, seven point sixteen millimeters. So know. was there more shrapnel inside? What was, uh, was more impact? The impact was harder. You know. Um, before that, the M1 carbine, those are small rounds, you know, small caliber. But uh, the M14s, the NATO rounds, they're picking up big rounds then. So you spend 20 days recovering, or yeah. not recovering, you're just in the hospital waiting mm -hmm. to come back. Right. Um, what's going through your mind at that point? Thank God I'm alive. I made it. You know. The moment when it, when it happened, you thought this is it. Everybody going to die. But once once you get wake up in the hospital the next morning, you realize you're still there. You know, you think you're thankful. You know, yeah. now you wonder what happened to everybody else, where your fellow Marines are, where they That's what concern. Did they make it out? Where's the unit? How they doing? You don't because you don't know. And daily, you know, that operation lasts over twenty days. And um, daily, somebody would come in from a different unit. I never saw my sergeant again because casualty was so heavy. The name couldn't take him, so this they had the uh, hospital shift the repos, and he went. He ended up going to the half. The guys went to the hospital ship. The other half went to the name. 
Yeah, so we go out. So once again, we'll split up. Never saw him again. These men that you're just in battle with. Yeah. And you don't get to see them again. I got saw this, I saw this, saw my sergeant. Because um, your sergeant takes all your information when you get there. You know, name, address, family, and everything. So when he was finally released from the uh, hospital, he, can't, he was stationed back at Camp Pilna. He came to visit me. I was, uh, I was recuperating on my mother's couch on 109th Street. And they said, somebody here want to see? I went and I looked up and it was Sergeant Thomas. He and, he and I already ran across the rice paddy together, you know. Wow. He said, I saved his life. I said, he saved mine, you know. But uh, he, he put me up for the Bronze Star. And I didn't get it because he went to the repost. I went to Denang. I was new in the unit. They didn't know his information was back at the, at the base camp. And he was aboard the hospital ship. So when he got back and turned in my paperwork for the Brown Star, time delayed. Yeah, so I was nominated, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they they know what you did. Yeah, they know. Yeah, mm -hmm. they know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you come back to the States, and let's see, at that point, how long how long had you been gone? It, total? Total, yeah. Like I said, less than a year. Just less than a year, mm -hmm. but life completely changed yeah. at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel like you came back a different man? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From from the day I went to boot camp, the day I went through, uh, came out of boot camp, I was a different person. I was entirely different. I was uh, from a quiet, timid kid to somebody who was ready to fight his drop up a hat. I go down any place, down to any street, late at night, day or night, and I thought nobody could touch me. You know. Yeah. That big bad marine, even though I didn't weigh but 175 pounds, five eleven, you know. But I had skills, you yeah. know. And uh, after that, it was just now. What am I do? The district got be medical discharge, you know. So just waiting for my discharge to come, and then I had to had had four four surgeries, and um, my parents came down to see me the first time. My brother, then um, my sister. And her girlfriend came, which ended up being my wife. Wow. You know, so they came for the second operation. Then the- Was the, this in LA? Where were you doing the operation? Camp Pendleton. Where's that? Oh, it's uh, near San Diego, between San Diego okay, and okay. Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's, well, at that time, it was the largest Marine Corps base. On the, on Are you recovering there? Is uh -huh. that- Yeah, the, yeah okay. The so you're getting hospital. surgeries, you're getting recovery. Right. Uh -huh. that, right. Got it. Right. And- um, they they I, they would let me go home. I had a surgery to give me a jar full of Darvon till you go home, you know. And I a that, jar full of what? Darvon. That was pain medication. Okay. You know, a whole jar of a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and uh to get out for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and I take them I take I sell them as uh red devils. And that was the big drug that was out there. And I, I four for a dollar. Four Make some dollar. money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You weren't getting paid that much. I think when I got out, I was making um, I was a corporal over two, making two hundred eleven dollars a month. Now, mind you, when I went in, and um, in sixty four, in August sixty four, we just got the September. We got a raise to ninety two dollars a month, from seventy two to ninety two dollars a month. That's what our boot made. Get paid every three weeks forty five dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. There was a lot, but there was a lot of money. You can buy everything you need. Cigarettes yeah. weren't but 10 cents a pack. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> gas was 15 cents a gallon. Yeah. Why well, didn't have a car at that time? So, you know, the, uh, all you had to do is buy, buy your food. Well, you didn't have to buy food. You did the mess hall. But you got $40 in your pocket. You're going to, you're going to, <laughs> to, you're going to buy what we call pokey bait. You're going to go buy you some pokey bait. Or the food trucks. The food trucks were just, it was like a lunch truck. Yeah. Then it would come back, go up from East Basin, eat off that as long as you could. Yeah. You know, but by being so close to Los Angeles, we would go home. I'd definitely go home every weekend, but sometime I'd go during the middle of the week, you know. But that was during training. But after I after got back, I had money, a little money saved up, about $2,000 saved up from being over there. And I went and bought my first new car. Wow. Uh, 65 Chevy. Yeah, $1,900. Yes. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was it. That was the car. <laughs> so you come back, 
And okay, so you're recovering. How long were you in the hospital and recovering over those surgeries? Mm. Throughout 66 and no, it's 67. No, it's 66. I got back, I got shot, shot in 66 up until about uh, almost a year because the surgeries were about uh, some of them were a month apart. And the other time was just being stationed in, in headquarters, you know, just waiting, waiting for my discharge and uh, to, the evaluation, the medical evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. So once you're discharged, okay, so no, let's backtrack a little. Your sister came to visit. Yeah, with my wife. And, uh, and but had you, so that was just her friend at the time that would then right. become your wife. Had mm-hmm. you, had you met her uh, previously? She remember, she remember meeting me because she came home as, with my younger sister and she saw me at the house. Yeah. So she knew of me. I didn't know of her. And in fact, I, I think as a teenager's, um, about the eighth grade, I remember seeing her walking down the street going to, because we did on 107th and um, near uh, about, a, about, about a half, about a mile apart from the school. And then she lived across another street. And I remember her walking with these pretty boots on, his little skirt on. <laughs> and I was too too scared to say, quiet and timid. I tried to speak to her. She spoke to me and kept walking, you know, so. That was that's quite a timid you, younger. I was, yeah. I was intimidated by girls. Yeah, yeah. I was trying yeah. to trying to be cool, you know, because my little <laughs> friends were there. You don't want to speak to you, you don't want to talk to her. I spoke to her, you know. She spoke to me. But when she came to see me in the hospital, and um, I, was, I was very appreciative, you know, that they came, you know. And uh, the next time she came, that's um, – because I usually come out – when I come out of surgery, I was able to, you know, uh, be able to communicate but this last time was the last large operation, and I stayed in recovery a lot longer. Well, they got stuck on the base. They didn't know how to get home. Your sister and Corette did? Right. Was, Corette was 16 at the time, but she had license. So they kept on trying to talk me out of my keys. When the, well, I kept coming <laughs> in and out of the uh, the, uh, the um, medication and I was trying to tell him where everything was, and finally I was able to tell her where my keys were. And so she drove my car back home and uh, didn't know. picked up some Marines, and they asked them, do you know how to get back to Los Angeles? All they knew, they were from out of state somewhere. Yeah. All they knew was to hear these two fine-ass girls in a 65 Chevy. <laughs> want to know if you want to ride to Los Angeles. <laughs> Hell yeah, they did. <laughs> you know. And... Uh, and that was a that was the beginning and me and Correct, you know. And a year later we got married. So at that point when when you and, when she came to you in the hospital, had you you had taken a liking to her, you said, yeah. Oh, I, I really mm-hmm. like this woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And clearly for her to come visit you, yeah, she was interested as right. well. She probably had remembered you from years past. You <laughs> she needed, did. She had a crush on she you. She did, she did. And that would, I mean that's the story she would tell you. Yeah. 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 So tell, uh, tell, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Tell me about the, I guess, the courtship or how the dating started. And it sounds like it moved pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that was the only girlfriend I had. And I was the only boyfriend, I guess, you know. And uh, she had the challenge at the time, my stepdaughter, Taria. And uh, she would just, well, I'm after that, after that stop having surgeries, I had my car. I would come home all the time. And, you know, and we'd see each other every weekend. And she was working at um, she was working at the library, and I remember I used to come home on, on the weekend to pick her up in my uniform, and these all these guards and stuff, you know, so police officers, they were all swarming around her desk until they saw the, the marine coming down the hallway, yes, you sir. know, <laughs> and I could see them just dispersing all the way, the way you know, because they heard about me and they knew about me. And they would see me every week. You yeah. know? So I pick her up right downtown, kiss her right on the man at right hey. the front door, you know. <laughs> and uh, let them know who it is. Yeah, they knew. They knew. They, they definitely knew. Yeah, made it known. And uh, then we just, just just stayed together, you know. Yeah. Decided she wanted to get out of home, get uh, go, go away from home, and I was, you know, ready to go. You know, ready to get married. Yeah. With nothing else to do, get married and uh, start a life. And that's what we did. Yeah. Know? Finally got married. And, uh, August 26, 1967. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that was your that was your, really your only serious girlfriend at a- well, Yeah, right, after high school, yeah, because yeah. Uh, 
I had a few dates in high school, but nothing serious, you know. What made you know that Corette was the one for you to get married? Because she stuck around. <laughs> she, had, you know, you know what? Like I said, what no cell phones. You get to talk on the phone. You get to fight with the phone with your brothers and sisters. Yeah. You know, so and I would drive over there, spend the evening over there. You know, we just, you know, because like I said, when I came in town, I would pick up from work. But uh, and the other than that, what at the base, you just go to the phone booth and uh, put the dime in and make. You, no, you would have to. We couldn't make no collect call because it was her mother's phone. So it cost you about a dollar to talk for about uh, about 30 minutes or so. You know, every every few minutes you got to put another yeah. 15 cent in there. That shows you care. Yeah. If, you, if you're paying to talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, she got paid every two weeks. And I got paid every two, but they were opposite each other. So I would have money. On one week, and then she'd have money the next week. So if nice. I didn't have enough money, I said, I ain't got money. Come home. Come on, i take care of you. You yeah. know, so she'd take care of me when when I go to, t- uh, you know, and then when I would come home, if I did, but be- that before I had the car, I would catch the bus. No, I couldn't take my car on base, so I had to leave it home. And I would catch the bus downtown. And uh, it's a little Mexican restaurant we started going to, right, at the bus station on 7th in Los Angeles. And we used to go there, and then we'd go to... Go to a movie, you know, and then go home. That was it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But How did the proposal happen? She asked me to marry her. We oh. were on a date with my sister again with her boyfriend, Echo Park. They put, um, and we just at midnight, 10, 11 o'clock at night, we walk around the park, you know, and uh, she, they were on one side and I was on the other. She said, well, will you marry me? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she said to you? Yeah. Yeah, she asked me to marry. But prior to that, you knew you wanted to marry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With just that the fact that you know we're messing around and messing around, sneaking around. So let's get married. Yeah. She wasn't old enough. Her mother wouldn't let her get married because she was uh, she was only six, seventeen. Okay. You know, so you're twenty. At that I was point? twenty. Twenty. Okay, mm-hmm. so about three mm-hmm. years. Apart. I got married. I, I just turned twenty one when I got married. You know, so and she just turned eighteen. I would be eighteen. That um. No, she was just she made, she made eighteen in December, I believe. No, she the good. She was eighteen, seventeen. She made eighteen that December when we got married. I think she was just still seventeen. No, she had to be eighteen because I was twenty one. She was born in forty eight. I was born in forty. Yes, okay. She she made eighteen in uh, December, and we got married uh, in Jan- in August. Yeah. Uh, did you get along with her family? And her, mm-hmm. Did you and her her family, her parents, get along? She was the only child. Okay. She was the only child. Uh, they didn't like me. The people that the damn people at the church, you know, they gossiping about, you know, um, I said Corey used to date one of my friends, my best friend, but they he was it wasn't a date. It was a date, but that's all it was. There was just no sexual content with it. He had girls all over the place, you know, so he'd go from one place to the other. Yeah. And in fact, when I we started going together, I wrote him and said, "Hey, correct wants to see me. Is that okay?" You know, I asked him first. It's good. But they, and I don't know why, but they um, they didn't they didn't like it. They didn't like me. They didn't like it. They didn't like the situation. In fact, they wouldn't um, they wouldn't let me get married. They wouldn't. I wanted to get married. We were supposed to get married June twenty six or sixty seven, but I was still in the military. And they said, well, wait till you get out and get a real job. Well, hell, that was a real job, you know. That And the, yeah, that's what they said, you know. Disrespectful. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it, we got over it. We yeah. got over it, you know. Did the relationship improve over time? What, with the family? Yeah, yeah. had to. <laughs> you know, when you go, you either like me or you. She's your wife now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a good person. I was a good guy. So, you know, yeah. you had to, you know. Uh, so you guys get married. You're 21. She's 18. So this is, let's see, 67. 67. Mm-hmm. Um, what is life like in Los Angeles for you guys at that time? Well, it's pretty good because I was um, uh, well, I was getting a, a good retirement, two hundred thirty some dollars a month, and I had a car, and uh, I had a job. I was making sixty dollars a week. And getting forty dollars unemployment, so in other words, I had about five hundred dollars a month coming in, so it's pretty good. Yeah, and that's in seventy, 
it was born in 69. So I started, um, I was going to school. That's what I started going yeah. to school and getting the GI Bill. I was getting that extra money. And um, I went and bought a house, my first house, in September 1971. Paid $23,000 for a house wow. on the GI Bill. You know, $230 a month, taxes included. And uh, so we, we're doing pretty good, you know, as far as, uh, I was, I was, what was I working at? I was making two hundred eleven a month, two hundred eleven dollars a month in the military. When I got out, I got a job as a janitor, making two dollars and eleven cents an hour, wow. which was, which was pretty good. It yeah. worked for Lockheed Aircraft, and um, they laid aircraft companies laid off every winter, and they call you back in the spring. Well, when they laid me off. And like I said, I had all this extra money. I had bought the kids all the uh, Christmas toys and everything in advance, you know, because I was buying it at the base and kept pounding. And it was a lot cheaper. And uh, so when I got laid off in, uh, from uh, from the aircraft company, I started working at General Hospital as, as a security officer and um, working there and going to school. And uh, after that, what happened after that? Got laid off from there and end up, I wasn't working for a while. I was just all just going to school and receiving retirement, you know. So about 19, 70, what the hell? Around 72. <laughs> yeah, it was 72. I bought a, my first motorcycle. That was my first big mistake I made. Bought a motorcycle. And then start riding motorcycles, and then start running over to a motorcycle crowd, <laughs> and drugs and alcohol got consumed me at that time. So I messed up pretty big back in that back in the middle seventies, early seventies, and uh, and seventy five. Correct, kicked me out. She divorced me, put me uh, tried to divorce me. So I left. The judge told me to leave the house. So I left, and I was out in the street for two and a half years. You know, just running the streets, running the muck. Come up, come up, you know, and uh, finally, they, uh, one day I just said, shit, the hell with this, I'm going back home, and I went back home, I pulled up in the driveway, I was staying with this other woman at the time, and I, when she went to work that morning, I just packed all my, I had my own place, but ended up at this woman's house, and I ended up, out and it had one piece of clothing there, then uh, closet food, moved some clothes over. And next thing I know, all my clothes, my TV's there. And I got to my own apartment. Me and my partner had an apartment in Inglewood. And I said, you know, if I had been doing this with, with my wife, I never would have got put out. If I would just stay at home and, and not run the streets like I was doing, I would have never got put out. So I went back home. And she uh, I was sleeping in the driveway. And she came, knocked on one of them. She, you ain't got to sleep out there. Come on in. And we got back together and then never left again. Wow. So I told you, you put me out the front door. I'm coming in the back. <laughs> so if you leave me, I'm going with you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and she kept me. And so, and she, I had no idea that happened. Oh, yeah. So you get the motorcycle. You start getting into this motorcycle crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, and into into drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that was a a way that you were coping from what happened in the war? Yeah, see, well, see, I never had a teenage life. See, my thing was, uh, I was, you know, I was, had the, the shock of going to, to hard white school, then dropped out of school, then going to the military. I went straight to the military, came straight, you know, I, I wasn't on the dating scene like my younger, my brothers and sisters then were. I was in the war. I was in the military for three years. I was in the military, you know. So when we got married, it was because we wanted to be together and they didn't want us to be together. So we got married because it stopped that. You know, it wait at the way she she was age appropriate, you know, nothing they could do about it. And um like I said, I, but I never <coughs> never did a nightclub scene and stuff. I tried, but then once I started riding the motorcycles, started going to clubs and um picking up women and doing the crazy shit I shouldn't have been doing. And uh, caught up with me. Caught up with me. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to let it go, too. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a very introspective that you went in the military at 18. You didn't have that teenage years. Because I do think it's important for people to be able to explore 
be single, go try new things that they're always yeah. interested in. Because mm -hmm. if not, then maybe if they're in a relationship, they might leave and go off and do things that they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did, like I said, uh, by the time my teen years came around, I was trying to figure out how to get out of get out of the house, and I knew it was going, the military was going to be the way to go. But like I said, when I joined the Marine Corps, there wasn't a war going on. It was the start of the next year. And I probably would not have volunteered if the Vietnam War had been going on. I probably wouldn't have volunteered to go to war. But once I was in, I had no choice. You didn't have a choice. No. So you're in there trying to do something. You had, you had no idea you were going to go to war. I was just getting out the streets. Yeah. Because there was nothing to do in the streets. You know, little jobs. You, and, you know, go to, go to the military and learn something. You know. It was positive. It was a positive right. decision. Exactly. You're trying yeah. to get your life on the right track. Right. Little do you know it's really going to fuck your life up <laughs> later on. Right. In, in yeah. life, both physically and, and mentally mm -hmm. and emotionally. Damn, Papa. But like I said, you know, the, when the, uh, the corpsman told me, shut up, you got a million dollar wound. And he was right. And I made a million dollars out of it, you know. Uh, he said that to you. Yeah, starting off with $230 a month. To, to the now today, I get $3,800 a month. It's all tax free. You know. So you're still getting money each month. Oh yeah, I'm retired. Medically right retired. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody. We uh, we took a quick break, bathroom break, quick smoke break, and we're back to uh, to wrap this up. Okay. A few more questions, Papa. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we've talked about a lot today, but we'll we'll just wrap everything up with a few questions that I had just about your life experience. One of the things that fascinates me is you know you were born in 1946. And over the last 75 years, technology has rapidly changed. I mean, television to color television, mm. internet and cell phones, right. the moon landing. I mean, so many oh, things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's real. It's real, everybody. Yeah. The moon landing is. So um, when I say to you, technology has changed over the last 75 years, what's one of the biggest things that comes to your mind that you've seen change? Funny to uh, say that because I'm looking at your studio here and, and your setup. Yeah. In high school, in junior high school, one of the class, one of the uh, classes I took was stagecraft. Yeah. Which was uh, audio visual. So I was, I was interested in audio visual, the movies and stuff like that because um, they would make movies in the in the city, you know, and then we go by the set and, and look at the cameraman and all the, the setup and everything. But in school. I was uh, in um, in a, a stagecraft and gave audio visuals. I would do t uh, go from classroom to classroom showing movies. Yeah, and uh, how to, how they worked the art lights in the auditorium and the, and the curtains wow. and all that stuff. And just think that I'm now here to with you in the studio. That's completely different. We had, like I said, that's uh, junior high school I went to was a new school. Yeah, we had all these new innovations and stuff. So our stuff was modern compared to the older schools in Los Angeles. And the technology, like I said, color TV, um, That was, everybody didn't have color TVs until sometime in the 70s. Everybody uh, started having them. Then, um, uh, like I said, my kids grew up with um, toys like tr Lionel Trains. The, the race car sets, slack yeah. cars and uh, things like that. And we built... It, uh, who did hand things? We played marbles, played hopscotch, tetherball, you know, kickball, baseball, football. Yeah. We played outside. We did a lot of outside stuff. We would, there were no handheld games, you know. You made your games, you know. Yeah. You, uh, like I said, we, um, everybody for Christmas, you got guns and holsters, you know, <laughs> or you got a. Um, Military fatigues and a, a, a machine gun and stuff like that. That the it's because of the war, and then the, and the invent of movies. With we saw a lot of westerns growing up. You know, uh, in fact, um, me and my brothers we were different cowboys. I was Long Ranger. My older brother was Roy Rogers, and my brother ahead of uh, right above me he was uh, Hopalong Cassidy. So those are the type of things that we did. And um, technology came along when Edward was, um, was it was a baby. Like I said, he, uh, man landed on the moon a month after he was born. He was born in June. Man landed on the moon in July. So it's us. That's the part of technology I remember, uh, because like my grandfather, he never believed man went to the moon. He thought he was filmed in Arizona. 
Yeah. Till he died, he just never thought man wow. went to the moon, and uh, t- could could imagine shooting a rocket up into space. And uh, that's what we grew up with, thinking about the Jetsons, flying cars. But it, but yeah. by two thousand, oh sure, we'd be fl- have flying cars by then, and we <laughs> just now getting electric cars. <laughs> so, so timelines not as much, but. What's so cool about, you mentioned with the, the moon landing is, you know, technology has come so far and now we've got rockets going up yeah. into space that are reusable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a huge space geek mm-hmm. and I, I love I love space. I definitely would yeah. want to travel there one day. Uh, I know you just got an iPhone, right? Yes. You, <laughs> welcome to the Apple family. <laughs> what is your thoughts on an iPhone? Tell uh, 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 the cell phone was a form of communication just for making calls and receiving calls. It was a tracking device for me. His, my wife wouldn't know where I was at all the time. <laughs> and call me, right? It, it couldn't track you on the phone, but she could always communicate. And if you don't me. pick up, <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I didn't want a phone, but I, okay, I got a phone, you know, from, yeah. it went from a beeper to a pager to a phone. And so I, the, the reason I had the Android phone for so long because I just, when they just said, go get your cell phone, come down, we'll sell you a phone. Well, I got a phone, got the first phone I had, yeah. the flip phone, and then uh, up to the, the Android. That was a fancy one, you know. And uh, so I never went to the iPhone because I wasn't computer literate. I didn't know all the little different devices, how to work these devices, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, But now it's just so much stuff on just touch of the screen. It's, it's, it's remarkable, you know, you know. You've got everything in there. Now you've got a GPS, a <laughs> yeah. camera, a video camera. Yeah. You can FaceTime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you fa- you FaceTime me, I think, was it last night or two yeah. nights ago to confirm <laughs> for this? Last night, yeah. I got that call coming. I was like, oh, man, he's got it down. <laughs> right, right, right. So I've never been able to do that with a, yeah. with the Android. Unless you had an Android phone, we could do it. But uh, I couldn't do it with your iPhone. Yeah. So e- Technology is fascinating. And obviously, I've not seen as much as you have. But even... I was born in 94 mm-hmm. to see the, the transformation of phones and what they can do now mm-hmm. is just fascinating. And then you've got people even younger, Rogan behind the camera right here is 18. Right. Rogan, you were born in, two, he was born in 2003. Mm. He, they've always had the technology yeah. and it's, right. and then there's people, it's, it's fascinating mm-hmm. to, to see what's gone on. Uh, so, We've almost been going for two hours, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up soon. But uh, I would just love to ask you some questions, just about advice for other people. I think you have so much life experience and so much wisdom to to impart on other people. Uh, what would be some advice that you would give to someone starting out as a young adult? Maybe they're just newly married, or they're in their twenties and they're they're trying to figure out what what they should do for their lives. What would you What would you tell them? Well, nowadays um, people are getting married later in life. Before they were, people would get married at uh, 18, 19, 20 years old, and um, really just they're a senior teenager, really, and didn't really know that much about life. And uh, like I said, my family uh, life growing up was oh, I always had a mother, but not a mother and a father together at the same time. And that it didn't start to my generation when I married my wife and. Uh, I stayed with my wife the whole time. I thought marriage is to, uh, something that you do one time. You know, you don't just jump into it. And I quit. I actually did jump into it. But my plan was to be married forever and have a family. And um, I, I, I never, I'm like you, you, uh, you and Kiana get married. Yeah. That was that was some event that I hate that I had to miss, and that was because of the pandemic and everything. And then Maya getting married, never saw her, get, yeah. never saw my kids get married. The only wedding I've been to was with mine. I think one of my other sisters got married. Out of all the other brothers and sisters, and my oldest brother, he got married. So um, nowadays, like I said, with the, the, the the way people communicate nowadays and the way, that, you know, you, so much, you you can see that person all the time. I can only see my wife when I drove over to her house or she can't drove over to my house. We saw each other then, but we couldn't just pick up the phone and look at each other all the time. And um, I think that's what's missing with uh, kids nowadays. No hands-on, 
Mm. You don't get to walk with your girlfriend all every place you go, hold her hand. And that was something new. You pride yourself in walking down the street with your girlfriend, your wife, you know, and yeah. being around. But now you can do it over the phone. And you may not see each other for a week, but you talk to each other every day on the phone. And and it wasn't like that then. Yeah. So. It, it's changed a lot now. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely changed. Personal um, contact is what I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. To uh, be around a person all the time, you know, as, as opposed to long distance relationships like what we had. So, do you think it's important to have that personal contact? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, very much so. You know, because if you don't, you stray off and go other ways. Yeah, yeah. It's important to be face to face. Yes, with people. Yes, we were just talking during our break there about uh, one of the issues we've seen with some of the younger generation is they, the communication, mm-hmm. everything's via the phone. Mm-hmm. It's instantaneous. Right. Looking at someone face to face, asking mm-hmm. questions, people feel uncomfortable. Right. Uh, they get anxious, mm-hmm. which that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I'm anxious about a lot of things too, but I also think it's important to face our fears and to put ourselves outside of our comfort zone. Mm-hmm. That's, um, that's the point of view that you have to, you, you have to realize that, you're going to have face-to-face confrontation, and then you're going to be at a point where you don't, and you, you miss that. And uh, I, I, miss, I miss my wife right now so bad, to, uh, you know, just not to have somebody who raise hell with me and uh, to tell me something to do today, you know, just <laughs> one more thing to do. Yeah. And I miss that. I miss that personal uh, communication. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I never had that with, uh, with this side of my family. Hey, with... Um, my side, but with uh, the Wilkins, I never had it uh, with Keanu, Maya, and Edward. I never were, we saw each other when we saw each other on vacations, or yeah. we sent for them, or we come see them, you know. But we didn't see them all the time, so I miss that relationship with them, you know, yeah. very much. That's one of the reasons I'm so grateful that you're here now. Yeah, because we get to spend time together. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Like when I first met you, it was just here he come walking the driveway. Who's this little skinny kid? You know, <laughs> what is he doing here? <laughs> you know, so actually, let me. Okay, tell me about that. What did you think when we first met? Huh? What did you think when we first what met? What is who is this? <laughs> what is, who is this? Keanu's bringing to my house. You know, it was a, a friend from school. No, it was a boyfriend. Okay, all right. Well done. No problem with it. You know, she like it. I love it. You know? Yeah. So and I thought you were a great kid. You seen clean cut and good, and uh, I was just hoping for the best of my kids. Thank you. you. Know. Mm-hmm. I was skinny then. Yeah. I was skinny. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we had met, that was right before my back surgery. Okay. So I was oof, I was rough. Mm-hmm. I was rough then. And then when you saw me last year, yeah. you were like, oh, man, you put on some weight. <laughs> hey, yeah, you did, <laughs> brother. Completely different person, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank That's, you. And just just from visual contact within yeah. a year or two, you know. Yeah, that was that was just a couple of years later. Yeah. But mm-hmm. you saw me. You met. We met at a tough time for me. At a very tough time for my health. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's been a hell of a journey, mm-hmm. just with with my back injury. What but year was that? We met in 2018. You okay. and I met in March, no, April of 2018. It was Kiana's spring break. Okay. And then we saw each other again. Um, at gra- Kiana's graduation. Yep, Kiana's mm-hmm. graduation. Right. And then we went to the Hawks game together. Yeah. So we'd seen each other yeah. a couple of times, but that was also a lot of uh, jackets on and it was cold, yeah. so you couldn't see. And then when we saw each other last summer, mm-hmm. the first thing you said, which by the way, that made my that made my day uh-huh. because my weight and my body is something I'd always struggled yeah, with. I mean, you had filled out, you look, I mean, like now, you know, you got, you got guns, you know. I'm, you, <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. And that, that just that the two year period, you know, you, you grew that much to me, you know. Yeah. And that much more likable, you know. I always did like you, you know. Thank I had you. no no reason not to, you know. And uh, and I still do. Yeah. So I yeah. appreciate that. And I've I felt so welcomed and loved into your family. Yeah. And one of the things I wanted to say, which is why I was so excited for you to be here, is uh, I never knew my grandfathers. Mm-hmm. My mother's or my dad's dad passed away um, years before I was born, and then my mother's dad was not a good man, and mm-hmm. he he was not in any of our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't really I never really had a relationship with my mom's mom. So the only grandparent I had was my my dad's mother and okay. she was in Florida. So being a part of the Wilkins family and marrying into that family, I see the relationship that they have with you and that they have with Charlie 
and it's it's just been special and it's that's why I was just so happy that you moved here to be able to uh have that relationship with someone that's older and wiser mm. and just develop that so I've seen they have a, a my relationship with uh with the Wilkins kids is different than what Charles and Barbara's is yeah and um I've asked them about it, and they told me, "No, you you just papa. You you know that's Barbara and Charles. You papa. You know grandma and grandma and papa. Yeah. And uh, and I appreciate that respect that they have for me. You know, they have such a deep love and respect and admiration for you, papa. Mm-hmm. They they truly do. And, I, th- I hope so. And mm-hmm. I do too. Yeah, I, I do too. Mm-hmm. Um, just just a couple more questions about here <clears throat> would be, what do you think? Looking back on, on your life, what would you say is a key to living a happy and a fulfilled life? When you look back, what would you what advice would you give to people? I don't know the, uh, the love of God, the love of uh, family, and um, didn't have very many friends, but it did have friends, and and they have but you have good friends, and they have bad friends. That's that's a conflict that you have to overcome yourself. You have to uh, determine which ones are good, which ones are bad. So that's a, that's a personal thing with uh, with uh, relationships and friendships. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think those are really important. Yeah. Well, Papa, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here today and being willing to talk with me and share your story. I know that's not easy to, to talk about those memories and those challenges that mm-hmm. you've been through. Uh, but I just want to say I, I have such a deep respect and admiration for you. I think thank you're you. a very courageous man, and I, along with everyone else, really thanks you for your service that you've given to our country. And uh, just thank you for for being the man that you are, and we and we really love you. Thank you. Appreciate hearing it. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in and listening today to Papa's, uh, <laughs> aka Edward Wilkins' story. Uh, I know it's it's been really, really impactful, and we just appreciate you tuning in. Stay tuned for the next episode of Find Your Edge. We're coming at you every single week, and we would love to hear your feedback. And just let us know if anybody that you want to have on the show and your thoughts on all the other episodes. Until then, we will see you guys next week. Take care. <laughs>